you're very welcome to our webinar on the launch of the manifesto. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, so, hello everyone. My name is Valerie Mollet. Um, I'm the Climate Justice Officer with NYCI and uh, it is with our team, the development education team, that we've worked together with young people to actually um, come up or bring their voices together in this manifesto. We are very excited about today and, uh, and we hope that you guys will also uh, really enjoy uh, the, the webinar that we have planned and also the discussion on the manifesto. So before I start anything, I would like to acknowledge uh, our funders and supporter uh, of this work, uh, without which we wouldn't be here. So uh, I, like Irish Aid, also Concern Worldwide, TROCRA, and the Youth Center, uh, of, uh, the Youth Research Center and Development in Minute, who have been uh, a partner in the Youth 2030 program. So thank you so much for all your support. And, but also really today, I, I would like to thank the young people, young people of Ireland from all corners of Ireland that came out in this, uh, during the Youth Summit and lended their voice on what they think should happen or what they would like to see within the climate change and how we respond to climate change and specifically I want to thank the wonderful group of young people that I had the pleasure to work with uh, throughout this uh, wonderful um, journey of creating this manifesto so the young people's committee of uh, youth 2030 program um, some of them you're already seeing them right in front of you but uh, there are many of them and some of them are actually with us in the audience. So a big shout out and hello to you guys. Thank you so much for all your effort. You guys should pat yourself on the back, the back because you guys are amazing and you're doing amazing work. Uh, without further ado, just to say a few words in terms of um, why, why we're here. It's a uh, we are talking about climate justice uh, because it is an important topic. Inequalities in our society have really taking on uh, a, a broader um, a broader spectrum and with the likes of COVID that has really um, shown us that uh, inequality only exacerbates any issues that we see in our society. So when it comes to climate change, there's nothing other, there's nothing different than exactly what we're seeing. So, um, and this is what you will see as well throughout the manifesto, the idea of climate justice rather than just climate action is what young people are asking uh, around the world, but also here in Ireland through this uh, document is because without understanding or without responding to the structural issues of our, the systematic issues that our society has, we won't be able to answer or respond to the likes of a crisis that we have that we call the climate crisis. So I don't want to speak too much today. I want the young people to actually speak about their thoughts on the, uh, on the on climate change and what they think should happen. Just to give you a little background on how the flow of the event will go. So we will start with um, a, di a discussion about the manifesto, the journey through the creation of the manifesto. We hope that you'll be able to join us in the question and answer session about the manifesto, about its content. So feel free to use the Q&A function that is uh, on your Zoom uh, link to actually put out your thoughts out there that our young, uh, the Young People's Committee present here will actually uh, answer. Then we'll move on to our panel discussion with our special guest, Mary Robinson, uh, Grace O'Sullivan, and also Selena um, uh, to talk about climate, uh, climate justice, but within the global, the, uh, the global context, because as we know, one thing with climate change is it's not going to be solved unless we all do it together. So it's very important for us to bring that perspective uh, within the room and within our discussion. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Alicia Sullivan and Caleb to take over and you guys have fun and enjoy this uh, webinar. Thanks so much, Valerie. Um, yeah, so as Valerie introduced me, my name is Alicia O'Sullivan. I'm 19 years of age and I'm, we're down here in sunny West Cork for the day inside the Ludgate Hub. So we actually have good internet. Uh, so hopefully there won't be any crashes. Um, yeah, so I'm part of the National Youth Council of Ireland's Young People's Committee, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. 
and essentially we just want to welcome you today there's over a hundred of you guys now joined us hopefully a few more um, and really just to talk you through how the manifesto came about uh, why climate justice is so important especially in places like Ireland which is a small island nation and yeah and hopefully have some really interesting conversations going so definitely uh, it's a good idea to think about everything that is being said um, and hopefully all of you will have uh, amazing questions uh, by the time that we stop talking. Um, so now I'm going to hand you over to Caleb, who is going to talk a little bit about climate justice. Um, so, Caleb. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me right. Um, it's lovely to meet you all, and I'm delighted that you all joined us today. My name is Caleb Hederman. I'm 17 years old, and I'm from Limerick. But today I took a trip down to West Cork to co-host with a few of my friends today. So. I suppose climate justice is such a, a broad term and it ties into so many different things. But as a person who has not faced the challenges and the inequalities due to climate change, my passion and I think the passion of the committee comes from the hope for our future and for our homes. A hope that I and the, the hope in that I, that I see that the people in my life can live in a world that is just, fair, sustainable and that we can discover the world around us. And a saying that I like to live by is, um, our sustainable future must reflect the power of nature. Strong, but gradual, graceful, but purposeful, and always moving forward together. And I suppose that ties into the whole idea of the, the sustainable development goals. And although today we're here launching our climate justice manifesto, climate justice is such a, a broad term that ties into so many different things. And I, that, that is a message that we really wanted to get across in our manifesto, that, that climate is, is such a priority, but it ties into so many different aspects of our lives. Um, so now I'm going to pass you over to Alicia to talk a bit about the history of how we actually came to this point today. Thank you. Thanks, Caelan. That was uh, definitely something to think about, and I suppose how we all view climate justice differently, um, but we're all fighting the same battle. So, so yeah, so the, the manifesto really <clears throat> originated from the Climate Youth Summit, which was held last year. Um, and the manifesto resulted from over 400 young people coming all from all across the country to the RDS in Dublin to discuss really Ireland's response to climate change. And it created that space for young people to learn about the SDGs, particularly SDG 13, Climate Action. And the consensus of the event was that you didn't need to be Greta Thunberg to make a difference. You didn't need to be speaking on international stages or at the UN to create change because everything starts from home um, and one little change can lead to bigger changes, just like Greta did herself. So essentially what the young people culminated was that whether it was your school or college or community, nationally or internationally, everyone has a vital role to play and you don't need to have a label as a youth activist or a climate activist to partake in this or to educate yourself or to educate others and it's just an amazing event and it was an amazing event and for something like this to come out of it where we now have over 100 young people in the room to discuss the manifesto which has developed and put forward this for Ireland to really look at and to hopefully Bring Ireland into the future and and achieve climate justice not only here but I suppose to look at our our uh, neighbours uh, all over the world and and to help them to fight climate change as well. So apart from the youth summit, um, Caleb is now going to talk about the Young People's Committee, which we are all a part of, um, and tell us what we did with the I suppose the information um, that came from the youth summit. Thanks, Alicia. Um, so the Young People's Committee at the National Youth Council of Ireland is a, a group of active young people from all over Ireland who came together to develop a call to action or manifesto, as you see today, to deliver on the youth voice in terms of our climate emergency, which we declared last year. We first met in, in early 2020 after our youth summit, which Alicia explained to you, um, to start up the journey of creating the manifesto you see today. Our committee is made up of 14 incredibly active young people who are David Poland, Jack O'Neill, Maya Kelly, Beth Doherty, 
Creed on over a coup, Dean Murray, Ross Boyd, Caitlin Grant, Patricia Gutteridge, Fatima Guitar, Keith Judge, Adam Lamb, Alicia Joy Sullivan, and myself, Caleb Hederman. I think one really important aspect to remember about our Young People's Committee is that not one of us come from the same background, and we all come at it from such a diverse angle and so many different organizations and places of work. Um, and that's something that we, we definitely have all brought to the table. Like I know myself, I'm, I'm an active scout from a very young age. Um, and even from there, I've been brought up with the principles of, the, of living by my scout law and my scout promise and staying true to protecting nature and leaving no trace. Um, and I know that everyone on our committee has, has very strong values when it comes to the work that they've done and the values that have been instilled with them through youth work and through the different experiences they've had throughout life. Um, so I suppose now um, I'd like to, to draw your focus to our Q&A function that um, at any time during the call that any one of you participants or anyone on our Young People's Committee can send in any questions you may have um, and then during the, the Q&A session that myself and Alicia are planning to do that we'll try best to answer all the questions that we, we can and hopefully help you understand our manifesto the, the values that we're getting across and the principles we hope to bring to a call to action uh, in the coming weeks. So thank you very much. Thanks, Caelum. So to jump straight into the manifesto and like Caelum said, um, to be thinking about everything that's in the manifesto, everything that's been said so far and, you know, what do you want to see come from this? Whether you're, I see there's people tuning in from the Netherlands, whether you're in Ireland or wherever you are in the world, what what is climate justice to you and how do you see the future of of climate change and climate action and, and climate justice for everyone so the first point on our manifesto was we call for unity so we thought this was had to be the first point because nobody is going to get anywhere on their own um, we are all fighting a huge battle and like we've mentioned it's different for everyone we all come from different situations but it won't matter when the, in 10 years time when everyone is again still fighting different situations but climate change will affect everyone no matter where you are no matter what background you come from and we felt that instead of pointing fingers at each other and blaming certain sectors or blaming certain types uh, sectors of types of people or rural or urban areas that we needed to all come together and really listen to the science because that's the key to all of this and I think sometimes that scientists are really left at the door and aren't invited into these conversations and I suppose in terms of climate change behavioral change massively comes into it and how we react to information and science is the only way we can do that and sometimes the reports can be really confusing to people who don't fully understand them which is probably the majority of us if we're going to be honest about it and it's it's good that the language is accessible for everyone um so that so that everyone can understand no matter where you are in the world and so that everyone can see the different types of climate change that is happening um like we mentioned earlier selena um youth ambassador from the marshall islands will be joining the panel discussion and when you hear her speak she's just she's phenomenal and the the detrimental effects that climate change has had on places like the Marshall Islands are are just stories that need to be heard and they're stories that aren't being heard and everyone here today is going to get the opportunity to hear that story and it's really going to sit in everyone's mind because I've met Selena she's a good friend of mine and it really just is you know there's facts and there's statistics and there's figures and there's science and it's all well and good on a piece of paper but when you hear it from someone who has suffered personally and their family has suffered it's a whole different story and you know there are people behind every fact and every figure and every statistic and i think if we can come away with with knowing that and uniting together behind that um we'll be in a much better place to to tackle climate change and achieve climate justice Thank you very much for that, Alicia. And I, I would definitely agree that I suppose one thing that is, is really important to remember across this whole manifesto is that all of these points will resonate with every single person in this room in a different way. Um, and no matter how much 
talking and explaining this. When you when you see something and you feel something, it's very different to actually living through it. And I know myself, I'm I'm quite looking forward to our our panel discussion where we can we can actually see and we can have the the real life experience of of the effects of climate change and and how we as as people who are in a position to make that change do it and and come true. So I suppose the next point on our manifesto is that we call for a green check. So how society functions in any given democracy is dictated by the priorities of its government. We must make climate change our priority throughout all processes we do. And through this, we call for decision makers to deliver radical people-centered policies that would support the transition we need. And I suppose this all ties back to what Alicia was talking about when it comes to unity, that we truly are all in this together. Um, and with the idea of sustainability is that it's, it's an overlying concept that, that ties into so many different ideas and projects that people can work on in our own communities and locally, nationally and internationally. And I think what's really important to, to notice is that the amount of people in this room today, which we're, we're currently at 118, um, which is an incredible turnout and it's incredible to see how many people really do care about a green check and really do care about making the difference and delivering on climate justice. Um, and through that, we can we can do so much talking about like what Alicia was saying about statistics and, and tying into the analysis of scientists and as well as that, looking at what our, our political institutions are doing with the new EU Green Deal and our recovery package. But at the end of the day, it's what we do as active global citizens, as well as active Irish citizens in our own communities at home and abroad. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think those points tie in nicely to our third point. Um, and just to let everyone know that you can read the manifesto. Um, it's in the chat now. Um, it's been sent in. There's a link. So you can you can read it as you're going along with us. Um, so yeah, so hopefully you'll check that out. So yeah, the third point is we call for a just transition. So we as a committee and as a, as a group of young people saw that, you know, maybe here in Ireland, we are not the worst affected um, visibly, um, but in the transition period that we see coming, um, which we've seen in, in the new programme for government and which we've seen in, in the climate youth rev, uh, revolution, really, and movement itself. Every country is taking huge step, steps forward. And even if climate change isn't extremely visible in, in our country of Ireland, definitely the transition period where we are moving from fossil fuel to clean energy or anything like that, you know, there is import, it is important that people are protected and people are not left behind. And we really thought that this was a, a key area that needed to be in the manifesto. And in a place like Ireland, um, where, you know, there's a lot of people employed in, in the Midlands. Um, I know David mentioned before um, in, in the bogs and uh, harvesting peat and such. And, it is extremely important that these people are, are protected in our transition and farming obviously is another key area that will need to be looked at um, and every sector will need to be looked at, not just, uh, again, we're all uniting together to create that change and support each other and create green jobs and a green economy. And that is why we deem that this point is so important that we're not pointing a finger at one person and we're not leaving anyone behind that we're creating a better society for everyone um, on every level and um, that you know it has to be equal and it has to be accessible and that is that that is how we will achieve climate justice um, and and it gives us an opportunity to to learn and to grow as as humanity and to care and reconnect with nature again because sometimes i think we think we are completely away from nature and we're not part of it although we we are part of it we are with nature and nature is a part of us and to 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 learn what is happening with nature we have to go with it and move with it and move with the times and um we have to bring people along with us and again like leave no one behind is is our is our key message in uh, in point three
And I suppose our, our last point, but, but not least important, most important, if anything, is that we call for a social justice lens to, the, to this climate crisis. So, as I was saying earlier, it's, it's those who are least responsible for climate change that will suffer its gravest consequences, as we've seen from the inhumane cases of climate migration um, all across the globe. We cannot solve the climate crisis by ignoring inequality and human rights. So we call for local politicians, national politicians, young people, organizations, and everyone in their communities and their homes to, to bring together global empathy and to, to leave no one behind in our, our just transition to a climate neutral world and climate neutral society and, and definitely to our, our green economy and, and just just quickly glancing through the the attendees we do have in the room today there is so many incredible people um from people from trocara stop climate Cha chaos I, I can see we have scouting ireland rep we have eco unesco we have usi um and so so many much more as well as political figures that i'm, I'm looking forward to, to or i'm looking forward to, to maya speaking to later um, and I can see her smiling when I say that. So um, yeah, it's it's. I, I I hope that we we explained our manifesto in in some shape or form to you all, um, and that I'm I'm looking forward to seeing if you have any questions. Make sure to send them through the chat function, and we'll try to best answer them when we can. Um, and we'll be doing that now. But I suppose um, I would tie it back to to the quote that I said at the very start about our sustainable future. That it must be sustainable in, our, in itself and it must reflect the power of nature and it must leave no, no one behind um, and I suppose that's a that's that's a message we we try to spread across the whole manifesto is that no one is left behind and that if someone is then it, it's not, not climate justice for everyone um, and it's a call for unity it's a call for a, a green check a just transition and for social justice um, so if you do have any questions, make sure to send them through to us. We'd only love to, to speak to you all. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. So the first question that came in is, how important is the word justice for you guys in the title of this manifesto? So does anyone here on the committee, maybe just like raise your hand, want to take that question? David? Hello, everybody. Um, so I, I guess it's a great question. Um, just want to stress how, how vital it is to us. Absolutely key part of, of the title. Um, I mean, Mary Robinson has been the champion of climate justice uh, for a long time now. So I guess we're just following her lead. Um, but I don't think we'll get to a carbon neutral world without the justice that we're talking about. Um, and we're, we want justice for human rights. We want justice for our biodiversity. And we want justice for every country. And, in the world. Um, so just to stress that justice is just a big a part of the climate change and transition. Definitely I would uh, reiterate what, what David was saying there that um, justice is for everyone and I suppose that's where, where the big change between climate change and climate justice comes in um, and especially I, I see there's a common thread of, of saying that Climate justice can't be achieved without social justice, and social justice can't be achieved without climate justice. Um, and I think that's something very important for us all to keep in mind as, as we go on into, into the rest of our week and the rest of our lives, that if you do take anything from this manifesto, that, that justice is, um, is the key principle to this, this manifesto. And I suppose that's why it was so important that it was, it was even put in the title that um, justice is for everyone. Um, and justice is for the people most affected. So, yeah. And I think as well in the current climate that we're in um, with COVID-19, the pandemic, we have seen um, the injustices in our world. And I suppose when we talk about, you know, how much access we have to healthcare, uh, just as, as related to COVID-19 and we see how much injustice there is and you know how lucky we are here in Ireland to uh, to be protected in in certain ways that in other areas of the world people don't even have a choice uh, 
or don't have an option or or don't even realize maybe um, how much is missing and i think we've seen the reflection that it's a similar approach with uh with climate change that the people who um the people who are worst affected really um just are the least contributing and uh i think we've all learned that in the environment we are now that yes we all want to get back to uh to the way we were before and back to normal um but i think one thing that i've definitely learned during lockdown is that normal definitely wasn't normal um and that we need a new normal and we need we we can take this time to reflect on ourselves um on the lives we lived um on the people we interacted with on the way we interacted with people um the way we interacted with nature um and take that time to reflect and, and take today as an opportunity to as young people or if you're a politician or whatever sector you're in to take this opportunity grab it this you're here for a reason um and really listen and hopefully the panel will inspire you more so um to do that um yeah so there may be another question um, yeah, just, to, uh, uh, just to finish on the, the justice side of things um uh, you know you mentioned earlier that i'm from I'm from East Galway, but I'm very close to the Midlands and I can see that the Port Namona peat factory is closed down. So I guess just to give people a, like a small example of what our, our idea of justice is. Um, I mean, the, justice Transi the Just Transition Commission uh, is doing a lot of work here um, because Port Namona has been closed down. And we as young people, we understand that the, the climate crisis is important and that we have to uh, end our peat production, but also just to say that I can, I can also see that our, our community, our small rural community that doesn't have a lot of jobs has really been decimated by the lack of those jobs. And, and it's just as important, and that's why we're talking about justice, it's just as important that those people are, are given the supports and funding to, to move on to either green jobs or retraining or, or retrofitting. Um, and another example, just last year, I was at the EU uh, Citizens Energy Forum in the Aviva Stadium with a couple of people here. Um, and there was a lot of interesting talk from our European partners and, and it was great to hear, but sometimes it was also difficult to hear people talking about heat pumps, which, which are brilliant, uh, absolutely. But in the same time, telling, telling people that they, they can't uh, extract peat and they should be installing heat pumps and getting electric cars. Um, but people can't afford that. And we had to stand up and, 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 and say that. Um, not everybody can afford a, a heat pump. Not everybody can afford an electric car and the charging station. So justice means having all of those supports available. Definitely. Um, I, I will completely agree with you, David. Um, so we have, we have two questions from uh, Iki UNESCO. Thank you very much, Emer. Um, it's lovely to see that you're on the call. So firstly, um, can we share the manifesto with others yet? Yes, please do. Um, today is our launch, um, and from here on in, we're we're hoping to get it, it it implemented and get the message across to decision makers as well as local communities that um, this really is a, a call to action from the young people of Ireland. Um, and then tying into your second questions, which which is the what are the next steps for the EU Committee now that your manifesto is launched is is lobbying and, and actually getting the incredible work that 400 young people came together in December to decide upon actually delivered and, and deliver the, the Youth Voice of Ireland um, and deliver uh, a just transition, deliver uh, a just economy and, and deliver a, a climate, climate justice within our Irish society. So the next, the actual next steps for our, our youth committee is nearly more important than the work that we've done in the past, which is actually getting the work that we've done to actually be done. Um, and call on those who are in a position to make the changes we see fit, actually do them. Um, and it's, it's great to see that we, we do have political figures here today, um, other than the, the incredible Mary Robinson and Grace O'Sullivan. Um, I know Alicia started up a Twitter trend last night, um, calling on local TDs to, to actually step in and, and join our conversation. Um, and it's great to see that some of them have actually come and, and joined in. Um, and I know, I know recently that there was um, the Climate Case Ireland, which was one of the first in, 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 the, in the world. Um, and I know, I know Beth was involved. So Beth, would you, would you like to, to jump in there? 
Um, yeah, just in terms of the climate case, Ireland, like it was really focused on the fact that our current climate approach isn't based in human rights and it isn't based in the principles of climate justice. It is very much going against what we need. It's not helping those who are most vulnerable in our society. So I suppose the whole idea there was following the Dutch example, following the US example to bring the government to court and to really examine, is this in line with our human rights obligations? Is it in line with the obligations we set ourselves? And we don't have the judgment yet. That'll be next February. But I think in my opinion, it's definitely a no. Um, and I suppose we're waiting to see what the Supreme Court will say, but it was very much the argument that what we're doing right now isn't climate action, but most importantly, it isn't in line with human rights. It isn't in line with an actual approach. It's really violating what we should be doing, the obligations we should be setting ourselves if we want to ensure climate justice and if we want to ensure a fairer future. So I think that was a really strong example of kind of people power and bringing the government to the courts to hold them accountable in that case. And I suppose one, one other question that we just got there. Thank you very much, Beth. Is, um, is what would the youth committee like us to do with this manifesto and how can we help to promote it and how can more young people get involved? Um, so as we said earlier that at the summit, we had hundreds of young people involved, but now we're, we're looking to get thousands, if not millions of young people involved now to, to actually deliver on what was called for. Um, so, so simple things that I can think of is, is, is start having those conversations with people you know, whether it be in your family, whether it be in your community, whether it be local representatives that you know, or whether it just be within yourself that you make, you make more social just and, and climate neutral decisions when it comes to how you consume products and how you go about your everyday life. But as well as that, that don't be afraid to stand for your own values when it comes to climate and don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe in is right. Um, and I suppose that is something that's really, really important with this manifesto that it's, it, it is an amplification of the youth voice of what came from our conversations and came from our discussions, but as well as that, that it's, it's a platform to empower further action. Um, and if anything, this is, this is just another starting block for another amazing group of young people to come in and, and, and take it off and bring it to the next level of we're actually delivering on climate action um, and we are creating a more sustainable Ireland. Yeah, and another question that came in that that ties into that is, you know, can you define what just transition means to you on the panel? You know, what does a just transition stand for? Um, and I think uh, that it's different for everyone, to be quite honest. Um, I think that, you know, if you talk about, uh, you know, what does it mean for you uh, as a person? It can be very different depending on where you are in the world, um, what kind of socioeconomic background you come from, or whether you live rurally or in an urban area. I know for me personally, um, in the position I am in and having the opportunities I do have, which I'm so grateful for, it's about, first of all, protecting, uh, protecting the people who are most vulnerable here in Ireland um, and, and abroad as well and supporting them and also protecting the future for ourselves here in Ireland because like I mentioned earlier we are a small island nation and we are vulnerable we are more vulnerable than a lot of countries are but we're also you know a lot better off than than some countries so I mean it, it is different for everyone um, and I'd like to hear if if anyone else on the on the panel would like to say what it means to them Um, again, just, I guess, seeing, seeing my community being uh, hit so affected by it, um, for me, the, it's, it's a transition that we, we need to move fairly. Um, it, as you said, everybody is uh, living in different backgrounds, whether it's urban or rural, uh, rich or poor. Um, it, can, it can mean a lot of different things to different people, but it, for me, it means the supports need to be there. Um, I, I just don't think um, as much and all as we want to uh, things to happen that people are going to actually listen to us if we just try and impose something on them um, especially even I think there was a question about the farmers as well and like farmers are going to be at the forefront of anything that we try to do so if, if we don't bring people along with us nothing is going to change so for me the, it, the, the justice part of it has to be always always there and some form of support. I guess um, for me um, a just transition is 
leaving nobody behind, that we are including every member of our community, of our global community in that transition, because we can never really fully achieve any like tangible, proper action and change if we're leaving half, half the population behind, more than half the population behind. And in that transition, that empathy is at the forefront of the actions that we are considering other people's lives, other people's cultures, religions, and we aren't just going with the one size fits all that people live different lives, people have different experiences, and that is talking about a transition. Yeah, absolutely. And, and David, you referenced uh, another question there about, uh, about farmers and how do you think is the best way to involve farmers in the transition to a greener country? And I think, you know, we're not pointing fingers or, or anything, and we're not blaming agriculture or farmers but it's a fair question to to ask and and sometimes there can be a divide between you know openly there can be a divide between environmentalists or people who want a greener economy and and maybe farmers or the agriculture sector and i think that needs to go i think we need to get rid of that divide and it just needs to be stopped and maybe sometimes it's it's something that isn't spoken about um, and I think the harder conversations a lot of the time are avoided and people can can waffle over them with, oh, we need to change the world. Um, but change starts from your house, your back garden, your community, um, your local area. And those conversations need to be had. And I think farmers are going to be of huge importance. Farmers are of huge importance to our economy here in Ireland. Um, and they always will be. Uh, for the foreseeable future and I think you know they are valued and we want to, for them to be, continue to be valued and to break the cycle of of name blaming which again we're, we're trying to get rid of in our in our first point calling for unity and just let's just let's get rid of 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 all this blaming and and finger pointing because we're all in this together and it's not one person's fault and the way we're going to get through this is by listening to science by innovate, innovative ideas, by moving forward with what's happening. And again, like David mentioned, um, those people need support. They can't do it on their own. And at the moment, I don't see very much being done for the farming community, to be quite honest. Um, and I think that's unfair. And like if we're calling, if we're talking about, you know, just transitions, that certainly uh, includes farmers and it certainly includes the agriculture community. Um, does anyone have something they'd like to say on that? Yeah, I guess just to finish that, um, like really, really, uh, we, we need to see farmers at the forefront of it. Um, and about some supports, it's, it's, it's all us, it's also not just about monetary supports, um, but actual education and, and helping maybe like new grazing methods or, um, best practices on growing without fertilizers. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways that we can we can try and change it. Um, and I guess even just instead of trying to impose something on the farmers, we should be trying to support them in having new initiatives and new ideas. So if we could help them plant trees and, and set aside certain areas for biodiversity, um, and instead of imposing that on them, but supporting them through the CAP grants or the Green New Deal or whatever way that may be, um, I think that's the only way that we can all move forward together. I just saw there that, um... Sally mentioned something really, really cool, is that there is a new um, climate justice project being led by Valerie, and where Macro and the Firma are a part of the groups that are organized or partaking in it. And I think that just shows a very promising future in Ireland, if you know, you're talking about education and making sure everybody has access to resources to learn about why we should be looking at climate justice. I think you know, we are move, hopefully moving forward in that area in Ireland anyway. And as well as that, I think um, as we as we talk about a just transition, I suppose the most imminent transition that we, we do see is the one of when we go back to this idea of, of normal again, and we, we come out of our of this, this post-COVID era 
Um, and I suppose one of the, the big questions is employment. Um, and one I would ask myself is, is about youth unemployment and, and how we can, we can take the idea of, of this climate justice manifesto to have, a, have an impact and have a say on what happens when it comes to youth unemployment and when it comes to employment, because that links directly straight to the education we receive. It links directly to the organizations we're involved in and it, it develops us into citizens and the people we will, we will be living for the rest of our lives. Um, and I suppose to tie it into another one of the questions that we received um, about that we, we have a new government in Ireland with, um, with strong green credentials. So what does this mean for our manifesto? Um, and, and obviously with, with the Greens involved in government, I think, I think we should be looking at it more that we're calling on all parties um, and all people in a public representative position to act on this manifesto and act on what the young people of Ireland are calling for, and not only the young people of Ireland, but what people of Ireland are calling for, which is climate justice, which is social justice, which is protection for our farmers, which is better education. Um, and that ties all into our, 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 our last point of our manifesto, which is a social justice lens to climate justice. Um, and if we don't look at it from the point of view that it's an overlying concept and that we need to develop all areas to fully develop one area, that I think we will be a long time at it. So I think it's, it's, it's most certainly a call for action. It's most certainly um, a call for decision makers, but it's also a call for ourselves um, and the young people who help to develop this and the young people who will read it um, to actually deliver on what we call for. Um, and have that level of accountability that we are the next generation that will live through this and that we must deliver. Um, so to tie it into to another question, um, I don't know, Alicia, have you seen any other, other questions that you'd like to, to tie into before we, we switch over to the next part? Um, there was one question there, um, a couple just looking for a little bit of clarity that I'm just happy to give quickly. Um, how many young people were involved? Did you complete surveys questioning young people's real feeling on climate change? So the youth summit that was held last year had over 400 young people from all different organizations all across the country. So they were the massive, um, I suppose, report that fed into our kind of very, very um, particular work then in just breaking down the manifesto, but they had the biggest say on really what went into the manifesto originally um and then also what do you mean by green check i saw yes can you explain the concept of a green check um so i suppose essentially what we mean by that is that as we're moving forward now and we're moving into this transitional period which we're we're, we're in both personally and um governmentally um that we look at the environmental aspects and the environmental, I suppose, effects of, of every decision we make, because everything we do um, has an effect on, on, on climate justice, essentially. Um, and that's, that's really what that means um, in its simplest terms, that, that we check that everything we're doing um, is environmentally sound and that we're not causing any more, um, I suppose, negativity or injustices to the environment or to to others by policies or by decisions we're making you know or individual decisions that that's something we can take on both personally um or business in business or you know when we're lobbying politicians in every aspect of our lives i think that's how we have to think moving forward if we're going to if we're going to try and um and fight this I see, I see three questions that have, um, that have come up and, and although they might not look that they link into each other, I think they do. Um, so firstly, are, are rural youth in Gaeltacht areas or, and offshore islands going to be included in the Climate Justice Manifesto action plans? Um, and I think that that's the most definitely yes. And it's, it's not only saying that, that people from Gaeltacht areas and offshore islands are included. I think that's us saying that everyone is included. Um, and then that ties into another question is, um, how can we include those 
who will be disadvantaged by more climate friendly changes in the conversation around climate justice. And I think that really, really does tie into our point about social justice. Um, and we need to look at it from, from the perspective of the impact over the intention. Um, and although we have put together this manifesto that young people have come together to develop, if the impact that is created from that direct intention, then we haven't delivered on what's been called for. Um, and I think we can't have proper conversations and we can't have that development of how we actually come together and, and fight for climate justice. It's not only an action and it's not only a call, it's a fight um, that we must come together. And that the only way we can do that is by creating sustainable economy, by developing our educational system to support those values. Um, and it, it ties back straight into the whole idea of the SDGs um, and that overlying concept of that all areas can not develop without one developing. Um, and I think that's where the idea of togetherness and most definitely unity comes in. Um, and then to tie that into the, the, another question, which would be, um, which, I, which is, uh, I love the first point on unity. Well, what would be your opinion on accountability and accountability for errors and faults um, for those in power? Um, and I think not only is it, a, is it accountability for those who make the decisions, it's also though the accountability on our personal lives and our individual actions, just like Alicia, David, Beth, and Maya, Maya had said earlier, that, that it's, it's all about tying it straight in to what we do in our everyday lives and that we cannot call for action if we don't do the action in our own everyday lives. Um, and if, if we go around and we ask, we ask politicians and we lobby with politicians to do these things and we won't deliver them ourselves, I think we're failing ourselves. Um, and I think we're, we're much, much better than that as, as young people, um, as citizens of Ireland and as global active citizens. I think we can, we can call for so much more. And I think this is only a starting point to really, really starting to deliver on climate justice and to actually help those most affected. And I think with, I think I, I would look at everything from a developmental point of view that although COVID is, is incredibly devastating for an economy uh, and for so many people along the world that I think we can use it as an opportunity to, to get this in here and, and actually deliver on climate justice. Yeah, and I think like, oh, sorry, can I come in? Yeah, <laughs> I think like really building from that, like the question about do we promote climate justice or do we promote social justice or are they mutually? And I think it is very much, they are completely linked. You can't have one without the other. Climate justice is about intersectionality. It's about a fairer society for absolutely everyone. And I think linking that in with, I think was Kira's question in terms of helping those who will be disadvantaged, the just transition, the whole concept of it is moving forward in a way where you tackle the roots. Because right now, we are living in a society where it is near to impossible to live perfectly sustainably just because of the way society is built. So I think a big part of the just transition is acknowledging the structural roots of the climate crisis and is targeting that and accepting that and moving forward in a way that helps everyone, that helps everyone at every level of society. And like we were saying earlier, it doesn't leave anyone behind, that provides employment in new, better ways that moves forward and tackles the structures of the climate crisis rather than just looking um, kind of at individual behaviours. And I think that is a massive part of the just transition is looking at the root and the key causes and moving forward in a way that is fair, in a way that provides equal opportunities, in a way that doesn't place the biggest burden on those who are most affected. Because I think that's something we've seen even on a global scale where developing countries are seeing the biggest impacts when really it should be developed countries that are doing the most work because they are contributing the most. I think that's a big issue we've seen. So it's really moving forward in the fairest way, providing employment in, a best, in the best way and looking at the structures and the roots of the issue. I think that's a very big part of it as well. And it is so inextricably linked with social justice in terms of that. Yeah, and someone mentioned um, there, Beth, in relation to what you said about social justice, you know, do we lead with climate justice as the main message and have social justice as a secondary message or do we promote them both mutually? mutually? So it might be interesting, you know, to, to discuss like the difference, like I don't really see there, there is a difference. I think they're both, um, you know, extremely interlinked um, and that the only difference is that, that climate justice looks at the impact of, this, of social issues in kind of an environmental uh, crisis, the crisis that we're in. Uh, Beth, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, 100% agree. And I think it is really an issue where we do need to be looking at every area of society. We need to be helping absolutely everyone. We need to be moving forward 
and it's not just you know sometimes when the way you move forward i think there's often like a view of like you know farmers versus climate activists or certain areas of society versus climate activism when really climate activism is about absolutely absolutely everyone because everyone is going to see the impacts of the climate crisis so therefore climate justice is for everyone as well it's for every part of society i think it's really about helping absolutely everyone and making sure people are brought forward and including them in the discussion. So it's not just one area of society talking about it. It's not just politicians, it's farmers, it's everyone who works in different areas of society and including those in those discussions to move forward in a very holistic way that involves every sector of society. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I think if we're gonna pull some sort of general consensus, it's that nobody can do this alone um, no sector or person or politician um, and that it's it's really coming together and it's it's amazing that you know young people have have taken up this this battle and this fight and it certainly is an uphill one um, and I suppose we're we're trying to carry the burden of of not just our our futures um, but the burden of the fact that it's happening already in the world um, and like I said earlier, people like Selena are are just you know just pr priceless to hear speak because it it really puts a whole new perspective on on the reality of, of climate change. And I suppose to to tie that into uh, the the next question that I see, um, which is how do we how do we explain the concept of a green check and how do we actually um, develop that into governmental policy and what was what what could be a great contribution um, so I think for me anyway I, I know myself I've been I've been trying to get involved quite quite more locally um, in and I think that that's something that all young people can look to do which is involving themselves locally and getting involved with campaigns and and one thing is at this moment in time as far as I'm concerned the PPNs in each county, public participation networks, uh, are calling for young for for people to join their strategic policy committees. And I know one overlying team of the Limerick Council, if not councils across the country, is climate action, biodiversity, and environment. And I know that's one place where where young people can need their voice to be heard, which is in local council. And from there, I think we can really develop it from a local level up. I see that we have uh, some incredible guests joining us right now, so I don't want to be talking that much. Um, so I think I'm going to pass it over to Maya. Um, but before that, I'd just like to thank everyone for their incredible questions and um, for listening to us, for trying to understand. Um, and if you leave with one message today is, is act now um, and together. Uh, bring a social justice lens and bring a sustainable lens to your everyday life as well as your advocacy. And as well as that, um, look at your own life uh, through a climate justice lens, through a social justice lens, um, and bring about your own behavioural change as well as those around you. Um, and together, we can truly develop the world around us. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alicia, David, Beth, and Maya for answering questions. And thank you, everyone who was here for sending in questions um, and sending in all your nice words. And I, I hope soon that we can all talk again, hopefully in person, um, and hopefully we can deliver on that. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I look forward to talking to you soon. So um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maya Kelly. I'm a 21-year-old student, also down in uh, West Cork. I'm from the Mizzenhead. And like Gaelam and Alicia, I am a member of the NYCI's uh, Young People's Committee. And Today, now, our next part is we are having a panel discussion with some amazing um, climate justice advocates who have done an immense amount of work in the area. And I think having a discussion like this will be really beneficial to kind of help motivate and inspire and show you the different ways that you can get involved in this kind of area. So I will um, introduce our panelists. Um, firstly, I would like to invite our guest of honour, Mary Robinson, to join us. Um, Mrs. Robinson is Chair of the Elders, uh, former President of Ireland, as well as the first female president, and a joint professor of climate justice in Trinity College, Dublin. And I, I bet most of you know that he, she is an amazing, powerful, strong climate justice advocate. And 
we're already really excited to have her here today. So welcome. Um, second, oh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> do you want to say anything? No, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Next, uh, we will also be joined today by Selena Narok Lam, who some of you might remember from the um, Island Nation Summit in One World Summit in Ocean Youth Summit in Cork last year. Um, an amazing, passionate, um, resilient speaker. Um, she was also the youngest member um, at the COP21 Climate um, Summit in Paris. Um, she is from the Marshall Islands. Um, she, listen, listen to what she has to say. She is a beautiful speaker, so passionate and just really, really moving. And I'm really, really pleased that she was able to join us today. And um, our, our third speaker, our third um, participant is um, Grace O'Sullivan, who is an MEP um, for the European Parliament and a member of the Green Party in Ireland, as well as an environmental education specialist, a former surf champion and um, a green entrepreneur. And I'm really interested to see what perspectives from an Irish level as well as a European perspective um, that you'll bring today. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really, really glad that you could join us today. Um, and I suppose what we're hoping to have is a very kind of organic discussion, um, really look at a different amount of things, see your perspectives and learn from them and just kind of unpack some of the different aspects of climate justice. Um, but to start a discussion, we, I have a question um, that I would like to ask all of you. So you're all um, amazing climate justice advocates. Um, and in our manifesto, there is a strong message that we have to work together to achieve action and change um, with empathy and unity at the forefront. Um, each of you are part of a different generation and have followed different journeys in working for climate justice. I was wondering, um, from your per personal experience, how do you believe that we can achieve intergenerational climate justice and bring an intergenerational aspect to the forefront? Would you like me to start? Yes, please. Fire away. <laughs> okay. That's great. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say that I'm really delighted uh, to be invited to be part of the launch of the Youth Climate Justice Initiative. Uh, I remember well uh, last November when you had your Youth Climate Revolution Summit that I think more than 400 young people participated in. And I was so pleased because I'm really, really keen on this intergenerational dimension and intergenerational uh, conversation. And actually, it's you young people who are giving me hope at the moment. You really are. Um, that uh, not just here in Ireland, but all around the world, uh, you're engaging and you're active and you're holding the adult population, my generation and the generation after me, uh, to account, particularly uh, the governments. And I have been very proud to meet some of you. I'm, I was proud to meet uh, see O'Connor a couple of times actually in Cork and also uh, Theo uh, Cullen uh, Mose who, who um, is from Clare Island and he made a wonderful speech at COP25 um, in, uh, in Madrid. I was so proud of him and then he's also produced a lovely blog for the elders uh, website uh, because the elders are very keen on this intergenerational uh, dialogue and we feel very strongly about it and of course I'm very pleased that I'll have the opportunity of speaking again with, if I may call her so, my friend, Salima Nurok, because we already had a very, very good discussion at the school forum um, a few years ago, and I'm looking forward also to hearing Grace O'Sullivan. So maybe if I just start with a little bit of input on the two things, on climate justice, and I think briefly also on COVID-19. Um, on, on climate justice, um, I've sort of learned over time and realized that there are at least five layers of injustice that mean we have to have a climate justice approach. And the first layer is the injustice that climate, the climate crisis disproportionately affects the poorest countries, the poorest communities, the small island states. That was my beginning, if you like, working in Africa some years ago. Secondly, within that, 
is the gender dimension. It also affects women disproportionately among those communities because women don't have the same social roles, don't have the same power, don't have the same land rights, etc. don't have the same access to capital. The third layer is the one that children around the world and young people have been talking about, the intergenerational injustice. And I'm so pleased that they brought this to the forefront. The fourth layer is a subtle one, but a very important one. There's an injustice of how different parts of the world came uh, to uh, build their economies, if you like. So for the industrialized worlds, we built our economies on fossil fuel. And now our responsibility is to wean ourselves off fossil fuel as quickly as possible. But think about developed, developing countries, the poorest countries. I was the special envoy of, of the Secretary General before the Paris conference. And I remember well, uh, so many of the developing countries promised to go green as much as possible, including the Marshall Islands, which is a very strong um, um, commitment um, to being net zero before 2050. So, uh, but they did say, we will need the investment, we will need the jobs, we will need the skills to enable us to do that. And really we haven't helped enough. We haven't shown that solidarity. And so they're finding more oil and gas and even coal. What are they to do? What's their dilemma? They've got to take their people out of poverty. And if we don't help them, they will go the wrong way inevitably and we will close that gap even more quickly to an, an unlivable world. So uh, we need that solidarity. And then the fourth, uh, sorry, the fifth, and I think, you know, for me, an increasingly important level of injustice is what we're doing to nature herself. Uh, what we're doing to destroy the biodiversity, uh, the extinction of species. We were told in May last year that we were at risk of a million species being extinct. And we're, we're destroying the ecosystems that support our life. And we should be more linked. We, we should understand what indigenous people keep telling us. We are part of nature. We're all part of that one and, and hold on to that. So uh, that is why we need a climate justice approach. And then briefly about COVID-19, it is a mirror that has exacerbated all the inequalities. It's actually shown us how unequal the world is. And it has shown us something that the feminist movement understood, the intersectionality. It's a clumsy word, but it's an important one. The link between poverty, gender, race, um, uh, being a person with disabilities, being a migrant, being indigenous, uh, the cumulative impact of uh, layers um, of discrimination. And we can learn some positive lessons. And I'll, I'll just briefly link four things that I, I think about when I think about COVID-19. First of all, people power. You know, it's our collective compliance with the lockdown, with the social distancing, with the, you know, washing hands, et cetera, that is our protection against the virus because there is no vaccine. So we are collectively exerting a power. And I think we should increasingly be aware of that. So when we come out of COVID, we should increasingly know we have power as consumers. We have choices we can make as consumers. We have decisions we can take collectively that will contribute to where we need to get to. The second uh, lesson is that government itself matters. We can see the difference between a government leading and a government not leading. And as a woman, I'm very pleased that women-led governments are doing exceptionally well from Angela Merkel in Germany to the prime ministers of Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, the president of Thailand, uh, Taiwan, sorry, just beside uh, China. They're all taking tough decisions and bringing their people with them. Another important lesson, science matters. You children have been saying, you young people have been saying, don't listen to us so much, listen to the science. And that's what we have to do. And climate scientists have to be front and center like the health experts are at the moment. And the final thing which speaks to your manifesto and the beginning of your manifesto is compassion matters. We are seeing a kindliness coming out. You know, there is something in human beings um, when we're open to suffering, when we're all in it, it's not equal, but we have that capacity to have more empathy. And I love the fact that you start with unity. Um, you know, it's like that old Irish proverb, is there scacha hela a warren nadini? It's in each other's shadow or in each other's shelter that we flourish. And we need that unity in Ireland and, and around the world. A unity that doesn't divide the farmers and the other lobbies and the this and the that. 
we're in it together. So that's a strength of your manifesto. And so is the fact that you're calling for um, a just transition, that you're calling for um, a social justice lens um, to get us where we need to be, I would say both on COVID and on the climate crisis. So let me end my contribution at this stage with words of the, of the chair of the elders before me, he was also my boss for a while, Kofi Annan. He loved to say, you are never too young to lead and you are never too old to learn. So I look forward to this conversation. That, that, is, that is definitely, I would definitely agree with that. And I really like the way um, you've used the different levels, like it's so put so simply. And when you put it that simply, it makes me think, how, how are we not? How are we not doing what we should be doing? Especially, um, you know, it's a, a res we have a, a shared responsibility to support um, other countries in this, you know, we're asking for a just transition. We have a, a duty, I feel like a responsibility to ensure that everyone can, can come with us, can, can everyone can go together. Um, and kind of on that, I, I'm really interested um, as to what Grace O'Sullivan's um, input might be here, just in terms of, you know, talking about Ireland's role and Europe's role in this. Um, to, to support um, our global community, um, especially in a time like this, um, when there's a lot of turmoil in the world. Are we still going to go forward with this, with the work um, supporting other countries in their transitions? I just be curious. Thank you. Uh, Maya and um, and uh, hello to everyone who's watching the webinar today and the National Youth Council and uh, the different 55 different voluntary youth organisations. Hopefully we've good uh, attendance from everyone and uh, to the Irish Aid Concern, to Maynooth University, Troker and all of Fridays for Future and all the campaigners. What I wanted to do, Maya, was I wanted to just start a little bit with my own journey because you are um, in the, that youth uh, position and I thought uh, part of the discussion today is about intergenerational um, and I thought uh, it might be um, uh, of use to just talk about um, essentially staying the course. So um, I... Uh, started myself in 1983 as, as um, an environmental activist and um, I uh, had the pleasure of being part of an organization called Greenpeace and I sailed on a ship called the Rainbow Warrior and we sailed in 1985 to the Marshall Islands among many of the islands in the Pacific Ocean and at that time in 1985 we were campaigning on the development of, of nuclear weapons and uh, the testing of nuclear weapons and it was the anti-nuclear movement and I remember and I say hello to, to Selena from the Marshall Islands because I remember the Marshall Islands and the, the low-lying atoll, these low-lying chains of, of islands in the Pacific among uh, other islands like um, uh, Kiribati, uh, Vanuatu, many other islands in the Pacific that today are at the cold face of climate change. Um, and it's, it's wonderful um, to see uh, Selena here. And uh, also I, I have to acknowledge Mary Robinson. Mary, you're living up to everything I know you are, which is, is great. But I, back in those days, um, we were, as I said, uh, um, uh, protesting over nuclear testing, underground nuclear testing. And uh, as young activists, the opposition against us was huge. And we sailed in to Auckland, New Zealand after our journey to the Marshall Islands, to Majuro. And our ship, the Rainbow Warrior, was bombed in the port of Auckland, New Zealand. And um, people will remember that uh, night where one of the crew members uh, was killed. It was the French government didn't want us highlighting their activities, their underground nuclear testing in French Polynesia. Um, and to stop us, they tried to deactivate us by bombing our ship. 
And it just shows you the kind of forces that, that we're up against when we're campaigning. And today, the big issue of climate justice is so crucially important. The unity that you talk about, um, but also, as I say, staying the course, like keeping focused, keeping uh, committed, because, um, you know, the evidence is all around us. And back in the, again, back in the 1980s, and this is again the intergenerational part, uh, I was part of two expeditions of Greenpeace to Antarctica. And there we saw the enormous, the immense, the incredible biodiversity. But we also started to hear about the impact of greenhouse gas emissions and global warming and the impact it, that was having in places like Antarctica and the impact it was going to have in the Martian Islands and across the world. And it just shows that, uh, you know, that everything is interconnected and interrelated uh, across the planet. And in, in 2016, I became an elected member of Shanna Dairn, the Senate, and now a member of, of the European Parliament. Um, I feel it's really been the last decade where people have woken up to the effects of climate change. Um, we're seeing the impacts across uh, societies. We're seeing the impacts uh, with biodiversity, biodiversity uh, decline. And because there is the global mo uh, mobilization of uh, organizations like yourselves, uh, youth groups, Governments too are starting to wake up because the evidence is all there and the pressure is, is, is coming uh, on stronger on, um, on governments and public uh, representatives and the European Parliament. So now in the last year, uh, just in December, we had the president of the European Commission, uh, a lady, a woman, Ursula von der Leyen, a mother, um, who uh, ha put forward her flagship, and that's the Green New Deal. And that's pushing towards uh, the whole uh, uh, reduction in uh, carbon emissions, towards carbon uh, neutrality by 2050. And there are, there are specific um, uh, mileposts in there that we are going to have to uh, work towards. But like I said, we need to have the support of the youth to make sure that, uh, that the objectives will be achieved. Um, and you are inspiring for people like me. You are the people who encourage me. I go out with you on the climate, the Fridays for Future. You know, my own two daughters um, who are in college here in Ireland, you know, are also climate activists. And now I see part of my journey as you know, uh, being the activist back in the 80s on nuclear, but being the active, activist in the 90s on climate justice, um, and, and now the uh, political uh, representative. So I'm hoping that with your support, uh, that governments uh, will live up to their climate commitments, that they will live up to the sustainable development goals. And it really hurts me when I see uh, governments uh, signing agreements or commitments, but not following through. And that's why uh, for me, it's enormously important that we live up to the commitments and, and we, um, yeah, we, we do what we said we were, were going to do. So we are in a unique time. We have COVID, we have a COVID recovery plan we're in, in a, a very uh, stressful time for people. Um, and uh, I truly believe that it will be the strength and the creativity and the uniqueness of the youth that will help to drive uh, the actions that are set out in the Green Deal forward. But we need, we need the emphasis and we need the, the support and the solidarity to make that happen. Uh, because it, it is a, a shared journey and um, it's a journey towards climate justice, but it's also a journey towards a green and hopefully a peaceful planet. Thank you.
that that's that's hopefully i really i really hope that um young people can and will i feel most many are very much behind it i hope that you know events like these and this manifesto will hopefully kind of inspire more people to stand up and to speak out and having you know uh, leaders like the three of you to to look up to and to to see fighting that fight it really does motivate a lot of us uh, so thank you so much um, Selena, would you like to share a bit of your journey as a as an activist? Um, that'd be that'd be lovely. Yeah, hoy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. I'm somebody from the global south to have our voice be heard in this monumental event. Um, it's great to see you again, uh, Mary and Grace, um, and thank you. I'm sorry, Amaya, um, for leading this discussion. <laughs> so I was going through the manifesto a couple of days ago and reading through it, I was suddenly inspired and reminisced a moment that I would say is bittersweet from my childhood. Um, Cause I was reading about how basically the manifesto came forth from 400 youth from Ireland coming together and wanting their message to be heard loud and clear because you know what is going on and you know how your government works and wants to put forward the demands in the way that we should continue forward in order to help not just your home but also globally to contribute to this movement. And so what I thought about was my grandfather and I've always credited him, credited him as the one who really pivoted me into my climate warrior work. And so he was telling me as a child about how the, the ices in both the North Pole and the South Pole would melt and soon our islands would submerge. And as a child being told this scary thing that might happen, I don't know um, if he knew that climate change was happening or he was just trying to scare me. Um, unfortunately, he has passed away, so I cannot ask him to confirm. But that really made my senses become so aware of the environment. And the next summer, I would think, is it just me or is it hotter this summer than it was last summer? And then I would notice the changes in the waves. And when he had told me that, you know, every year we would always get annual king tide. So these are big waves that would come and inundate our islands. And I'd never really been scared of them. I, I to, to, to a degree, yes, but not really at an alarming rate. But after he told me that, it was the first time that it became clear to me that I, my entire family, all of us on the islands are literally surrounded by water. And that was such a wake up call. And if we were to find ways to escape, like we really didn't have the means to do that. And so I came across this reading on corals and I was still very young. And I read that corals grew towards the sun in shallow waters. And so I thought, yes, this is it. And so I brought my friends together and we all went and collected corals and put them all out in a line by the barrier reef when it was low tide. And every single day we would go and check on these corals because what we, when we had put those corals out there, we had envisioned that they would grow up to be these ginormous corals that would act as a barricade to protect our island, our home from the upcoming water. And so I remember I felt so relieved and I looked at my friends and we were all so giddy and we were like, oh my gosh, we did it. We saved our home. <laughs> this is what we needed um, that our adults didn't think about. And I stopped having the nightmares that um, of these waves coming in and me frantically trying to swim and saving my grandparents and also my siblings. And so that helped for a while, but 
as dedicated as we were to going to watch these corals to ensure that they would become they would become barricades to save our home, you know, we eventually stopped because I guess we grew out of our childish imagination. Reality hit us in the face. But even despite that um, disappointment um, and feeling like, oh my gosh, we've lost it. There's, there's no more hope for us now. Um, looking through the manifesto and in it clearly stating for unity, it reminded me of that unity that all of us, my, my friends and I, just kids united together and built this crazy plan to try to save our home. But it wasn't, it was enough, it was very little enough for our home, but it wasn't enough on a wide scale, on a global scale. And this is where I saw and I realized what the missing puzzle was. And what we needed was youths and adults alike all around the world banding together to come and help save our planet. And through the Youth Manifesto on Climate Justice, it's calling for unity, green check, transition that is just, and social justice lens to the climate crisis. All of these being addressed is really issue, key issues that people from the global south and those, those severely affected by climate change and eventually those who are in a more privileged position than we are will soon affect them as well, indirectly or directly, soon it will. And all of that address what we from the Marshall Islands need, what we from the Global South need, need and what we from the world need. And even though it might not be what, it might not be, we might actually need more near very soon, but it is a step in the right direction, a step that we should have taken long ago, but a necessary step that youth from Ireland, all of you guys have come together to really push. And it's so inspiring and it really warms my heart to see that, you know, us in the Marshall Islands, us in our home in the Pacific have not been abandoned. Um, there is still hope and you guys are our hope because all of you are leading out there where we cannot reach while we are doing the work on the ground as well. And so uniting together from the grassroots to the up, that's a very important um, interaction and, and uh, uh, coming together that we are seeing together right now. And so I would like to share the wise African proverb that I believe all of us are very familiar with. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. And all of us in this platform right now and outside of it and our earth, all of us still have years left in our storybook. And we all must unite to care for each other and every single one of us. And very much ensuring that we don't leave our earth out of the equation because that is still a child that we as villagers need to take care of. With all of that, I want to thank you once again for opening up this space for the Global South to share what we have always dread, but we need to come out of that and focus on the solution. And this is one solution that will definitely take us to where we need to be. Thank you. Alina, it's, it's just so good to hear you. And again, that powerful voice that was there at COP21 and is still going strong. But I think you should remind us also, or I'll remind us, that the Marshall Islands played an absolutely key role in that Paris Climate Conference, a key role a leadership role because you were living the urgency and you've brought that home again talking about the king tides your childhood your grandfather but it's now also more so and i think you must continue with your voice you young people from the south must keep that sense of urgency which 
um, you know, really has to kind of energize us to understand that we have a big hill to climb over the next while, that we have to do it in the worst of circumstances because of COVID, but we have to do it together in a way we never, never thought of before. It's just great to hear you. Please keep speaking, youth from the South, keeping us, you know, feet to the fire um, of how urgent it is, because that's your role, to, to just keep reminding us, this is life and death, this is survival, this is urgent, 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 and then we'll get there. Definitely, thank you. <laughs> And can I just say as well, in terms uh, of um, leadership, and thank you, Selena, that was, um, it was beautiful to hear the story of your grandfather and it brought me back to the Marshall Islands. But um, in terms of the sustainable development goals, Ireland played a huge role there because uh, one of the co-negotiators, the co-chair um, of the um, final agreement was David Donoghue, former ambassador, uh, Irish ambassador and it's something where Ireland uh, needs to remember that we can be good at taking leadership we can move forward and we've seen some amazing leaders uh, including one who's around our virtual table at the moment Mary Robinson but no but really um, it's that inspirational leadership that helps to uh, set the path and the vision uh, and, and bring people together. And that's the unity, it's about bringing people together. And I think uh, today is very important because this intergenerational approach is critically important. As I said, I'm hugely inspired by the youth. I love the youth engagements. I love getting out there and standing with the Fridays for Future, any of the activist groups because of the, the creativity, the innovation, the way that um, the songs, the chants, and all of that that helped to unify us. Um, and that is really powerful. And we see that all the time, even recently uh, outside the European Commission and in the European Parliament, we had Greta Thunberg uh, arrived with a, a huge uh, group of climate activists. And again, it just copper fastens where we need to go and how we need to do it. And it pushes us, we're in the European Parliament um, and this, the European Council and Commission, we're in a, a, a new, a relatively new mandate. We have a five year mandate that we're working towards and there's one year passed and in that we get the Green, uh, the green Deal, but also um, we get new strategies. So there's new strategies on the table now, the biodiversity strategy, and that looks at huge increase in um, the way we produce food. Uh, the use, uh, uh, an absolute reduction in uh, synthetic pesticides um, and more forestry. And so there's moves in the right direction. But the problem just at this point in time is it's words on a paper. And that's where we need you to come in because we need you to just take the, the essence of those strategies, the farm to fork strategies. And they're all, all of them are highly cognizant of the climate uh, dilemma we're in at the moment. And uh, as Mary said, the, the industry wanting to continue to pump out the fossil fuels, pump out the, the, the gas, we, we need to move away. But the beauty today, and it wasn't there back in the 80s when I was out on the high seas as an activist, but what we do have today is we do have the technologies, the renewable winds, the solar mechanisms. We have, we're moving towards green hydrogen. So we, we, we have the technology. Now we need to ensure that it's put in place to displace the damaging fossil fuel uh, production and industries. And the other thing to just remember, and I'm so sorry, do remember plastic and the role of plastic in the whole issue of climate change. Mm. Its majority is fossil based. And as long as we continue to allow and enable industries to produce fossil based plastics in our clothes, in our cars, in our, what, everything around us, then we're going to continue to enable the industries that are effectively destroying our climate. Just building on what you were saying, Grace, because you, you now have your responsibility as an MEP. Um, 
we have this big recovery package, which they came to agree. We have to make sure that that recovery package is completely aligned to the Green New Deal, to the biodiversity strategy, to the um, getting rid of greenhouse gas emissions. It's not clear yet that that is, you know, and it's going to come before the European Parliament. So I hope you and others will be strong voices and that young people will be gathered outside insisting that this recovery package has to be part of the solution. It's not a short term. It has to be aligned to the Green New Deal. Yeah, um, I mean, look, everyone's probably aware through the news and social media over the last days, there was this uh, discussion, uh, the council met in Brussels, the heads of state. So from Ireland, our new Taoiseach, Micheál Martin was there. And they were talking about, you know, the, the recovery fund to support a, a, a recovery, but it must be a green and it must be a just recovery. And as I said, the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, certainly from listening to her, I, I believe her ambition is, is good and it's, it's positive, but it's to mobilize everyone around her to, to push in the same direction. So this, the person charged with the Green Deal is Franz Timmermans uh, from the commissioner from the Netherlands. But now it, it's to make sure that the youth in all the countries get in behind their politicians. Because remember politicians, the majority want to continue on the path that they're on. Because it is like, it is um, a, a very interesting place to be in politics when you're part of the, the, the influencing and maneuvering and, and creating of legislation that's going to move us into a, a, a more climate just uh, uh, world. Uh, but um, at the same time, you do, you have that creative tension between those who want to stick with the way we've always been doing things, because that's what we know, and those who recognize that that, the way we've always been doing things, the status quo will not stand up anymore. If we want to secure a future, a sustainable, a real future for humanity, really for humanity, biodiversity will, is part of the big picture. But I mean, those species will adapt as well. But for humanity, particularly, then we are going to have to um, uh, really uh, recognize that if we don't change from status quo, we're on a path to nowhere. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really strong point. And I think um, we're just coming to the end of our panel discussion. And if I could, I would have the three of you sit here and talk about this topic <laughs> for hours and hours, because I think this kind of discussion um, is really inspiring and motivating for a lot of young people. And, you know, a lot of us have been, you know, having, having to go it for it for a long time. And sometimes it feels, you know, especially at the moment, um, when so much is online, it can feel very draining and people can be burning out and it can be really tough. And I think having events like these with people like the three of you is just really important for revitalizing that you know motivation and drive and so i thank you so so much for taking the time today to speak to all of us and hopefully inspire and motivate even more young people to to join uh, our fight for uh, climate justice and with that i hopefully um everyone will stay around for it i will pass the mic to um beth uh another member of the youth Youth Committee, and um, we will launch the manifesto. Yeah, thank you. Can I relive? Thank you so much to the entire panel for a wonderful discussion. So I suppose um, one of the first questions is kind of, you know, why are we here on this Zoom call right now? What is the whole purpose of this manifesto? And this manifesto really came from young people coming together, you know, from young people seeing the impacts that the climate crisis is having right now on hundreds and millions of people. This has come from young people taking a stand, refusing to accept what is happening and to stand by while we see the biggest crisis we have ever faced. And that is where this manifesto's power comes from. The power in young people calling for a complete transformation. 
for climate justice, for an approach that values human rights and equity above all else. Its power comes from people, from a united front. And that's where all of you come in. From today, we're launching this manifesto as a pledge for anyone from anywhere to pledge their dedication and commitment to making sure that it is followed through with, that it translates into real concrete action from our decision makers and that it helps to create a new, fairer reality. And that's one of the basic principles here. For that to happen, we need everyone. We don't just need one group of people or one area of society because the climate crisis will impact every single one of us. And that's why climate justice is for all of us. It's for creating a better world for everyone in every area of society and enabling all of us to live in a new, fairer normal while tackling inequality in every area of our world. As we launch this pledge, we also launch a call for unity. And that unity is where our strength is going to come from. It will come from a very clear message that young people are united in these principles, that we are united in refusing to accept the history that is being forcefully written for us, and that we are united in calling for a fairer and better world, not just for our children, but for ourselves. This pledge is the power in young people coming together to show dedication, to show unity, and to show strength in the face of crisis. And with all of that in mind, I would like to invite President Mary Robinson to launch this pledge and to be the first signatory if she would be willing to. Thank you. It is a, a, a real honor. And I'm so encouraged by the commitment and spirit and the thought that has gone into this manifesto and the very beginning of it being that unity that you've emphasized and the just transition and the climate justice lens. These are what we need. So I am so happy to be the, to sign on. I'm not quite sure I'll, I'll send you my signature or you can consider me signed on, but uh, this gives me great hope. And I'm a prisoner of hope because that's what Archbishop Tutu told me to be um, for the elders. Um, but we need young people to keep, keep us honest, keep us straight. Know that your future depends on how much you can continue to urge us to take our responsibility. And you're doing it, and you're doing it so well. And I'm very, very proud of you. Good night, really live, Galer. Thank you so much, President Robinson. And we'd also love to invite all of our panelists to sign on to the pledge. And just as we draw the launch to a close, there are a few more words of thanks that we'd like to give. So firstly, to our guests, President Robinson, Grace O'Sullivan, and Selena nurk -Liem for attending and sharing your experiences, your insights, and your knowledge, as well as just highlighting the amazing work you've done and also the reality of the climate crisis and the work being done on the ground. Um, I'd also like to thank the Young People's Committee for all of the work and dedication that has gone into even making this a reality in the first place. And finally, also to thank Valerie and Leo and all of the NYCI for their consistent and unrelenting work in dedication to making young people heard and creating a space for change to happen. Before we close the Zoom call, there are just a few final words that we'd like to end this event on. So this manifesto is really a reflection of young people, of their dedication and of the need for change. And that doesn't stop here. That doesn't stop when we turn off our computers and we walk away. Take the power and the unity from young people standing together and bring it into absolutely everything in your life. Challenge the structures around us that facilitate the climate crisis. And above all, push for justice. Talk to those around you, engage with decision makers, take a stand for fairness, for equity, and for a world in which the question of equality doesn't have to be asked in the first place. So again, a massive thank you to all of our panelists for coming today and for helping us to launch it for everything you said. It was absolutely wonderful and inspiring. And I think I speak for everyone when I say it was absolutely incredible. And for everyone attending, please take that message of change with you. Please do the survey that's being sent in. Please sign the pledge in the chat. And thank you all for being here and making change happen. And I hope that you take everything that was said and heard today into your lives and continue making change. So thank you all for coming.